This website catalogs and archives a list of other websites that could be used and abused by hackers. And I mean both kinds of hackers here, the good and the bad, cyber criminals, threat actors and adversaries, and security researchers or penetration testers, red teamers, and ethical hackers. This is the Living Off Trusted Sites, or LOTS project, put together by Mr. Dox. If you aren't familiar, Mr. Dox is an incredible individual doing sweet security research and sharing a whole lot of education just as well. And this might be very similar if you're used to other websites like Lolbass or GTFO bins, Living Off the Land Technique, or using natural native inherent capabilities that might allow you to break out of an environment or do something with a little bit more tradecraft. In this case, living off trusted sites is all about using legitimate domains and websites when performing phishing or exfiltration or command and control ultimately and download potential tools to evade detections. In most cases, a lot of these websites are not going to be on a deny list or filtered by an internet filter. So these are options that could be used to, hey, take advantage of a trusted site. And here's an example, right? Let's dig into filetransfer.io. See, that has a couple options for potentially phishing, downloading things, maybe offering a capability for exfiltration. Say, oh, they just upload malicious files and use that as a link. Well, maybe that's a little bit more trusted. Hey, maybe folks might be familiar with that service usually used for genuine good purposes or exfiltration. Hey, just putting data back and forth as needed or downloading files or anything. Now, with all that context out of the way, I do want want to say, look, yeah, we could probably make the claim and you could argue that any sort of website could be used as command and control. You could make anything a C2 server or C2 framework if you really wanted to. My good friend made a, a command and control out of the Jackbox video game. Like you play on your phone, and it's all web sockets back and forth. Let's turn that into a C2. But I think a common conversation is how can we use like software focused services, things that are related to coding and development and oftentimes security research and tech. How how can that be used and abused? And we've seen it a little bit, kind of in the current days here, that GitHub as an option, and it's literally like the top listing results here on the Living Off Trusted Sites website. We've got github.com and raw.githubuser.com. We could take a look at both of these, but obviously, look, you host files or code or anything up on GitHub. Well, maybe that could be used as some potential communication with a target endpoint or victim in a command and control sense. I think that raw.githubuser content Content.com is especially noted for command and control and noting that look malware has been seen using this and there are a couple other ways that this could be done. It might not strictly be just uploading, adding, or making changes inside of a repository. There might be other tricks that are possible with GitHub. In this video we're going to chat about it but before we do please let me say look the only way that I can get out free educational videos just like these as frequently as I do is with the help of some sponsorship. So please allow me to tell you about the sponsor of today's video. Keep Deeper security. I gotta be honest, I look for the most secure solutions on the market. Every organization, even my own, needs to secure passwords, credentials, secrets, and connections, all to reduce the risk of cyber attacks. And Keeper Security offers a privileged access management solution to deliver enterprise-grade protection all in one unified platform. Their PAM solution enables your business to have complete visibility, security, control, and reporting across every user on every device, so even a small IT team can manage and protect their environment. Keeper integrates with infrastructure and identity access management stacks and works out of the box with your other technologies for password rotation, passwordless authentication, SIEM, CICD, and so much more. It fits right into your organization without the hassle of deployment and maintenance. Keeper PAM is purpose-built to protect perimeterless and multi-cloud environments with the features and functionality that your organization needs. I've seen Keeper personally at tons of different cybersecurity events and I've gotten a chance to chat with their partners. Seriously, it is always high praise and proven success with their platform. With over 275,000 five-star ratings in app stores, users rave about Keeper. With Keeper, you can keep your users, your data, and your environment secure. Learn more today and sign up for a demo with my link below in the video description. jh.live slash Keeper. Huge thanks to Keeper for sponsoring this video.
Okay, getting back to it. I'm over here on github.com. I could log in, hey, sign into my account, and then navigate around to look at other repositories. Let's say, just for the sake of example, let's dig into one user and their repositories. This is Gus Rodri. He is a fictional, uh, fake character that I created for one of the OSINT challenges or open source intelligence tasks from NomCon CTF in a previous year event. Hey, and by the way, NomCon 2024 is coming up, coming up this May. If you'd like to play the Capture the Flag challenge that I'm hosting, that is May 23rd to the 25th. Hope to see you there. Sign up on the school board. I'll give you more details as we're getting closer to the date. Anyway, say that I were to go visit one of these public repositories. Let's go to Gus and his development project, whatever, I don't know, some random stuff here. But if I were to go create an issue, I could potentially just start a new issue, right? Hey, have a input box, have some text, have something where I, I don't know, could just put in anything here because the gimmick is that this is all temporary and ephemeral. We're not actually going to create an image, but we're going to use some of the features and functionality that's presented here. Because I'm not sure if you're familiar, but say you're creating like a readme.md file for the front facing document of your new repository or project. If you wanted to add images there, you could try to upload it, host it, have it available on the internet so that it could be included inside of the readme. Now there's a little trick with GitHub where if you were to actually try to upload a file or drag and drop something into an issue box or the kind of comment that you might create or anything that you'll supply to type that in, it will automatically upload it to GitHub and give you a publicly browsable URL based out of that repository. Now here's the thing, what's to stop me from trying to drag and drop or upload a file into someone else's repository? Is that totally possible? Well, let's try it. I'll go ahead and over to my desktop, just create a new, I don't know, text document, that's fine. We'll call this hello world.txt, fine by me. Let me open that up real quick. Let's say, ha ha ha, hacked from John. LOL, please subscribe. Haha, <laughs> cutesy, dumbo, fun. Now here's the kicker. I don't need to enter anything in for this issue. I just simply need to drag this into the GitHub issue and it will upload it and then grant me with a new URL. And that is just the file that I could then access. Let me see if I can go open it in a new tab. Open up a new tab, paste that in and okay, now it starts to download. <laughs> Look, even if I were to open up in like new incognito tab or a private window, obviously that's totally public. It's not related or tied to my account and that will just be publicly accessible. But the kicker is in that URL. I don't know if you caught it, but that URL that's provided for this new publicly accessible document that we've just spat out across the internet is presumably going through github.com slash Gus Rodri, that individual, that company, that business, whatever it might be, and then, hey, just something based out of their specific files and accessing whatever I wanted it to look like. Now let's think this through here because you could upload whatever you wanted to. Hey, malware, if that's the case, I don't know. Maybe command and control communication, right? Oh, tasking a beacon or an agent back and forth is like an implant. And at least from the artifact or quote unquote, the indicator, the URL that's there, it looks like someone else's. The blame is then on, oh, I don't know, maybe that individual and their GitHub username. Whether it happens to be Gus Rodri or John Hammond or Microsoft or government agency XYZ, right? Now, if you happen to be saying, hey, that looks familiar, I feel like I've seen that before, you could be totally right because it was in the news. Hey, this over on Bleeping Computer, looking at this article, GitHub comments abused to push malware via Microsoft repository URLs. And this is exactly what we've been just chatting about. A GitHub flaw or possibly a design decision. This has been around for like forever. I'm pretty sure this is just the natural inherent functionality of GitHub issues and being able to upload and store a temporary file there, whatever it happens to be. Like an image for a readme documentation, just as we saw. But it could be abused by threat actors distributing malware, putting them in any repository that you want. Like Microsoft in this case. Obviously this tends to make the files appear to be trustworthy, but again, this could just go anywhere. It doesn't have to be strictly Microsoft. They do this in a couple and they discuss, look at this URL, exactly what we were just seeing. Oftentimes you'll see other images and videos is actually put into a different location called assets, but dragging and dropping anything like a text file that I just tested or an executable or a zip archive would just go into slash files. Even if you don't post the comment, like you notice I never created that issue, it'll just still be brought to life, uploaded into GitHub. And the blame goes to someone else. The URLs look like they belong to the company's repository. 
And a lot of folks have been chatting about this. OA Labs or Open Analysis Live, Sergey, an incredible person, fantastic work that he does. He's been stating, look, he actually saw a sample, some malware strain using and abusing this with, uh, was it Smart Loader? Yeah, Lua in this case. Frank Hobb told Bleepy Computer that Smart Loader is commonly installed alongside other payloads like, oh, Redline, Info Stealer, classic. Haven't heard anything from GitHub and Microsoft here. And I, yeah, I guess that's a curious because again, this in my mind has just always been the intended functionality, but could be taken advantage of. And hey, by the way, if you're not familiar with OA Labs or Open Analysis and Open Analysis Live, Sergey, his whole team, all those individuals are geniuses, incredible people doing great stuff, always sharing education similar to this. They even go a whole lot more deeper than I do for some disassemblers from debugging, great decompilation and unraveling and extracting malware. So super cool stuff. Please show them some love. But he's talking about it. On any repository that you want, you can just upload this thing. So at one point I had a thought could this be used as a command and control setup and structure just all over GitHub with temporary on the fly ad hoc and ephemeral files that we upload through just dropping it into a GitHub issue without even needing to post the issue or create the comment. So I wanted to think of, hey, how could I take advantage of this in an automated way? If I were to drag a file in and recreate this, could I actually be taking a look at the developer tools like the browser info and see maybe in the network is there anything that I could recreate or do in an automated way? Python scripts, Golang, whatever automation we might like. Is there an API in the mix? And you'll notice, hey, it posts to assets with a little bit of details here, maybe an auth token that's just temporary for that request. Obviously you need a logged in session here, but is there any of this data that's worthwhile to be taken and pulling out from? And there are some Amazon things in the mix. So I'm now realizing, okay, this is an S3 bucket, one of those AWS, hey, cloud storage locations and not just a simple easy O oh, post request with one endpoint. Kind of goes back and forth to GitHub production, maybe a specific ID, and then the unique keys and values, everything necessary for that file upload. I thought that, hey, this would be a cool video. This would be something to demo and showcase, and wouldn't it be even more cool if I could share a tool or release, hey, some capability, some project on GitHub, something you could download and play with to do exactly this and just spray and push out and, hey, use command and control capability over any random GitHub repo that just is out there on the internet. Now, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit sad because, hey, I wanted to get this video out previously, but now that this article, this bleep it computer write-up is out and about, I thought, oh, you know what? Hey, we should probably get that out the door. The thing is, I never finished the code to create this as a tool and capability, but I had this kind of canned and in my mind for maybe the past month or so. You can see way back at the end of March, I wanted to get this out the bout. This is a snippet of the code that I was playing with and never finished. This is really half-baked and not totally feasible as a demo, but it's kind of exactly that idea. Hey, just manipulating, recreating a lot of the network communication back and forth, but I never got it to work. And I have a hunch, well, look, it's getting into a lot of those Amazon S3 shenanigans that I don't know all about, I'll be the first to admit. Maybe you could do this with Bodo 3. Maybe it's easier to just recreate this network connectivity. But at the end of the day, I never figured out a solution to automate it, and I don't know anyone who has. If you have, please, please, please let me know. I think that's pretty neat. Maybe that's a call to action and worthwhile if any of you are interested, but it does give a little bit of a segue to some more conversations that we can have. Because if you were taking a look at OA Labs' little stream here, what he was showcasing, discussing there, a lot of the comments are like, yeah, this is clearly an S3 bucket and it's not in the repository of GitHub. That should be made clear. It isn't going to be a file just in the repo. One thread that is worth pulling on a little bit though is that look, if we're actually seeing some of this used and abused in the wild, oftentimes real malware, like the simple loader Lua thing or small loader, whatever it was called, if they're uploading malware in a .zip file format, so it looks like a release asset to large open repositories. Then they share the links as though they're the re legitimate release links for that project, but the release notion is interesting to me. Because you know how when you cut a new release of some software. You publish this new version out on GitHub and you could supply and upload these assets that are appropriate for that new version or that release. That is made available and you could totally automate that. There are GitHub APIs and GitHub Actions things to make that streamlined and easy. So I was chatting with a couple of my friends on all of this. Hey, using GitHub as a command and control framework with just regular files in and out of the repository, with GitHub issues, comments, things you can drag, drop, 
in and out, and maybe now even using the assets capability when you cut a new release to do whatever you might like. Now this is something that we did get to build a proof of concept for. Take a look, here's command and control just as a simple POC via GitHub releases. In this case, you will need to automate some interaction with the API, which means you'll need a GitHub access token configured and put together. We can create one super duper simple. I'll build out just a small sample testing and playground repository, but we'll note here, hey, let's put in our GitHub token, add that in, and it will be embedded in the binary. That can be obfuscated, of course, if you were to do this kind of thing for real, but this is just the proof of concept that I wanted to showcase. The idea is that we'll use the release assets of any GitHub repository to hide or smuggle some data, command and control instructions, malware, whatever, and because it is public, right, you will need to have some encryption in the mix. So we'll generate some keys, public and private key pairs, and then we'll have an agent that's actually going to do the work, kind of get these things in and out, communicate with the GitHub command and control to store and set this as a registered release asset. And then say the other end of the communication is just pulling that data down, decrypting it, and then doing whatever it might do with it. We're not doing anything in this case. There isn't a full-blown client application or the C2 server itself, so to speak. Again, just a demo for education's sake. So let me create a new GitHub repository. We can call this whatever, I don't know, NVIDIA driver build or something stupid. Doesn't need a description, public, private, private's fine. Uh, add a readme, no, it doesn't care, let's do it. Now that that's created, I'll stage an access token. I'm not gonna show you that, but you saw the instructions in the steps. Now let's do that demo. I am inside of my Kali Linux virtual machine. I'll open up a terminal with control alt T. Let me change directory into my git directory in the GitHub C2 folder. I do have this cloned and downloaded and I have created just that GitHub GH token. So that's present in the environment. Now I will go ahead and just generate the encryption keys. Oh, we'll mark that as executable. Appreciate that. How about now? Will you work for me? Looking good. Now bear with me for just a sec. We're going to have to kind of, Hey, press the, I believe button and say, look for the sake of showcase, we'll have our implants and command and control instructions. I don't know, maybe some malware sample or the payload that we'd like here. I could spit that together, like run local Sam dump or something. I don't know, simulating that idea. Now back in our sandbox repository, I have just added a readme file. So there's some content there because ultimately we need to create a release, something to start with so that our agent and our proof of concept can work with this. We will create a tag. I don't know, just call this uh, our release, something for creation sake. And then it doesn't really matter. Oh, what the title is. Yeah. Build release and video anything. This is just for the sake of showcase. So let me publish that release and that is staged and set for us. But now we could manipulate and add these assets with our proof of concept tooling. I'll put these side by side and now I'll use our GitHub C2 agent where I can supply with the arguments that we configured for this, the repository reference with tag R. In this case, that's just my username with the NVIDIA driver build repo name. We'll supply tag N to say a name for, I don't know, what might be present on the GitHub release page at the file name for it. We can just call that like build release or whatever. And then tack P to specify the path of what we'd like to try to showcase and bring up there. Let me use just that temporary file that we were working with totally not malware. And fingers crossed, if I run this, okay, that is seemingly done. Now let me go refresh this page. I'll control shift R. Yeah, and here is our build release, just present there. Now say that our C2 server, or the framework client, whatever here at the communication, it could pull that down. It could go retrieve our build release. And for the sake of showcase, I'll just bring that into my virtual machine because it's a private repository and all that. But obviously, if I take a look at that build release, it is just nonsense. It is encrypted. It is going to have some of the communication structure and a offset, quote unquote, that we put in there because it's public data. But now with our tooling, with a little proof of concept that we put together for using GitHub as a command and control framework, we could just decrypt the file. We can just pull the data out as we would have with the keys that we put together and all this trade craft here. So I could at this point just use the private key for the keys that we've staged here to use our open SSL decryption routine for the file that we've just downloaded. I stored that build release download in the age directory. We'll use the private key that we have and we'll decrypt this out to our out file. How about that? And I'll hit enter on this, fingers crossed. Now I have my out file created and taking a look, this should just be are totally not malware.txt. In this case, I'm gonna get staged as a zip file. Yeah, so we could unzip that. 
and there you have it. At the very least, the idea for command and control over GitHub. And I gotta say, there were a whole lot of options here. Like we were talking originally about, oh, you know, files that just go back and forth on a repository. And then look, hey, just actually using the issues and the comments that could create a new file upload that could go back and forth over the assets and those locations, URLs that look like they're someone else's repository. But even then, if we use the releases and release assets, that is very sneaky. Because once again, we could use anyone else's repository, fork it from there, and doing this as a GitHub release, just cutting new software and new versioning, look, the only thing that even slightly indicates that something might be amiss, something's afoot, there are some shenanigans here in Tradecraft, is just simply the timestamp, if it happens to be communicating rapidly as C2 might. Everything else looks completely normal and just the same as it always would for any sort of release. If anything, look, all that I wanted to showcase in this video is that there are multiple ways we could do some sneaky tricks with using GitHub as a command and control framework. You could do that for a tons of other websites, but as this one was a little bit in the limelight, you know what? I think maybe there's still more to chat about just as well. With that, thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. Please do all those YouTube algorithm things, like, comment, subscribe, and hey, please show some love to our sponsors. Keeper security, link in the video description. I'll see you in the next video.